Hi, the humble lead or light emitting diode you're no doubt familiar with. And you're also likely familiar with the concept that an LED's light output is roughly linearly proportional, fairly linearly proportional to the amount of current that you put through it. And if you have a look at the data sheet for any LED, you can see that it's pretty much uh, the intensity versus current is pretty much a linear concept. And that's great, but I got to thinking what actually happens down at extremely low currents, and in particular at what current does a typical LED like this red one here actually switch on and start emitting light or start emitting photons? Hmm, interesting question. Let's test it. So to test this, what we need is a device that allows us to actually not just measure light intensity, but measure essentially small numbers or individual photons. And that's exactly what we've got here. Now this is a reasonably expensive bit of kit I've got here. It's a photon counting module and it does exactly what the name tells you. It counts photons. You've seen this in a previous uh, mailbag video. And it's an extremely sensitive uh, photo uh, sensor in here. Basically, um, performance similar to or better than a traditional uh, photo, photo multiplier uh, tube. But this allows us to basically feed in a light source here. So it works by measuring the light input here and giving us a uh, count out here, a pulse every time a, a photon hits the sensor inside here. So there's no real reason why we can't stick a lead up its clacker here and adjust the current. I've got a very low uh, current source which can go down to uh, picoamps or even femtoamps if we have to and count the number of outputs per second or photons per second. Let's give it a burl. Now the part number for this is SPCM AQR13 and I'll link in uh, the data sheet down below but if you have the black cap on here there's no photons getting in there, no light getting in, it'll still actually give you some pulse count outputs. That's called the uh, dark count and this one actually is supposed to be not faulty but is supposed to have a higher dark count than normal but hey we can actually uh, check that. So um, this particular model, the AQR13, here's a look at the data sheet. This one has a maximum dark count value of 250 per second or 200, you know, a nominal base uh, limitation of 250 photons per second. So, but, you know, we can measure the average of that, null it out, and then stick the lead up as clacker and hopefully, you know, see where this LED actually switches on and emits you know, maybe not an individual photon because we're down in the uh, noise of uh, the dark count of this thing, which is going to be uh, random. So we have to do some uh, averaging and uh, try and, you know, do that. But we could probably measure, see a difference in tens of photons, or we should be able to, tens of photons coming out of this lead. And for this test, we're going to use my trusty Keithley 225 current source. Uh, it can go up, it can go anywhere from... Uh, this is the nanoamp, so there's the decimal point, so 0 0.1 nanoamp up to, we won't go all the way because we'll blow our uh, LED, but it can go up to uh, 100 milliamps. So we're driving this lead now at uh, 5 milliamps, and of course we can go down, it's going to be decent. 0 0.1, yeah, we can still see it, I'm not sure if you can, yeah, you can see that on camera. And, you know, we can go down to microamps, nanoamps, and if that's not good enough, we can use my Keithley 261 picoamp source, which has a resolution of 10 femtoamps. Beauty. If you're just wondering what other sources I have in the lab, well, I also have a matching Keithley 260 nanovolt source. So, yeah, how many people have a nanovolt source? Mmm, brilliant. So I can generate femtoamps, picovolts, and I've got high voltage power supplies as well, where it, so I can go anywhere. Um, in terms of voltage, I can go anywhere from uh, picovolts all the way up to, you know, over a thousand volts <laughs> in just in those two instruments. Beautiful.
Now this might look pretty ridiculous, but I can assure you it's essential. I've wrapped it all in some alfoil here. This was after wrapping the uh, lead. I hooked on, wrapped it in the black electrical tape here. Many turns it Count was a little bit high um, without the alfoil, so I just added the alfoil on here. Several uh, turns there and just folded it all over so it should be nice and dark inside. And that's exactly what we want. So I'm just going to leave it for a bit and we'll just get an average... Uh, figure here mean is up to yeah around about 214 215 or something like that I've got the uh, current source actually switched off at the moment so yeah we'll get an average figure um, after a couple of more minutes and then we'll just take that and then we'll increase the current and for those wondering, do the lights in my lab actually make any difference? Is it actually seeping in somewhere, somehow? Well, the answer seems to be no. The um, mean hasn't really changed. I switched my lights off here in the lab and no, that is the true dark count. So it looks like our dark count is just, uh, you know, 212, something like that. It is under the data sheet value of 250. So whoever's written on the front of this thing that has, has a high dark count, nope, seems to be just fine. Oh, and by the way, this uh, particular Perkin Elmer unit has a peak sensitivity around 650 nanometers. It can do like the whole uh, visual range plus in the outer edges as well. But it's peak sensitivity about 650 nanometers, which is why I'm using a red lead in there to actually uh, do that. So, you know, it's fairly close, should be fairly close to its uh, peak value. So let's have some fun. Let's actually ramp up the current and try it. I have no feel. I haven't done any ballpark calculations for, you know, E equals HF and all that sort of stuff. You can actually, the efficiency of the lead, which will change down at the bottom end as well. Um, I'll see if I can pull up a, uh, in edits, I'll see if I can pull up a graph of uh, how the efficiency actually drops off of the LED at very low current. So that'll change your E equals HF formula if you try and calculate all sorts of stuff and things like that, the efficiency of the LED. So yeah, anyway, we're not measuring like the voltage across the LED and things like that. We could, but uh, yeah, I'm not doing that in this particular experiment. Here we go. So I'll just reset the statistics here and I'll switch it on make sure I don't uh, blow the thing. It's at 0, 0.00 nanoamps. So here we go, we're going to switch it on. So there should be no difference in uh, that. Let's go for one nanoamp. <laughs> I don't think it's going to do anything. I'd be very surprised. No, no, our count seems to be the same. Okay, here we go. 10 nanoamps. Hey, no, no, see, got fooled. You got to use the mean. Got to use the mean. No. All right, let's ramp it up a range. So let's go to uh, 100 nanoamps. 100 nanoamps. Mm, no, no, it's not looking like it's changing. I mean, I'm not going to quibble, you know, I'm not going to uh, muck around with, oh, it's got a, hey, whoa, what did I do? Whoa, what happened there? Hello? Something happened there. Are we right on the threshold of the knee where that LED will actually uh, come on or not? Because, wow, we just jumped up to 1,500 uh, photons per second. Wow. Okay, let me uh, ramp that back down to uh, 10. Yeah, I'm back down to 10 nanoamps now. And we're back down to where we were. That's interesting. Okay, I'll ramp it back up to 100. Actually, it's 110 now. 100, yeah, there we go. So, okay, back down to 10. It looks like we found it. We found the current at where it starts. Let me go to 20. This is 20, uh, 20 nanoamps. Yeah, look at that. Around about 20 nanoamps. Yep. Yep, it's start to go up. I mean, we can reset our stats now. I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at the count there, and you can sort of see from the count that it's doing that. It, uh, yeah, there we go. Bingo. About 20 nanoamps is all you need. Maybe, ten, you know, between 10, 20 nanoamps for this particular LED. Different ones with different, manu you know, manufactured in, in with different uh, technologies, with different sensitivities, things like that. It's, there's going to be a huge difference. But this is just a, by the way, just a junk bin uh, eBay kit LED. So I have no idea. Don't know what the data sheet is. You know, it's just like, yeah, one I got from eBay in a kit. So there you go. 
at 20 nanoamps, we're going up, we're getting about 266. So we're about 42 uh, photons there per second at 20 nanoamps. I'm going to see if we can get some data on this thing. Hmm. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up and uh, graph the data here in uh, 20 nanoamp uh, jumps. So 20, 40, 60, 80, etc. Um, I'll take it over. There we go. A minute, 427. So I'll take that count as 427 and I'll try and get a graph of this thing. I just find it amazing that we're actually counting individual photons here. I mean, this is, you know, quantum physics stuff, how the LED works, the, you know, the band gap voltage of, you know, the voltage of the LED. In this case, well, it's probably not 1.8 volts for a typical red lead because we're down at, uh, you know, right at the knee of where the thing switches on. Um, well, and not the knee where it kicks up, but, you know, right down where it just starts emitting the photons and the recombination causes, you know, emission of photons. It's like E equals HF fundamental quantum physics. This is absolutely brilliant. Oh, you can play around with this sort of stuff all day. And one thing I was curious about, is there any triboelectric effect in the cable? Because I'm actually using a coax uh, cable coming out of my current source here, and just uh, vibration in cables, shock and vibration in cables, it's a legitimate phenomenon and can actually uh, inject charge into the cable. So I'm just having to play around with it here, and... I don't know, it's, uh, it doesn't seem to be any different, so, yep, I can't, don't think I can see anything there, so that's not an issue, I just, it just popped in my head, hmm, yes, I am aware that putting the uh, alfoil over this might change its uh, thermal properties of the case, this, uh, the sensor dissipates a fair bit of power, there's little fins in there, but I don't have any airflow here in the lab, so, you know, it's not really a big deal, and, hey, it's aluminium. No worries. And I know what you're thinking. Dave, this isn't the right tool for the job. Horses for courses. Come on, use the proper tool. All right, normally I would say that, but there's a little bit of a snag. Here's my Agilent 53131A universal counter. And in my opinion, every, any lab who does not have a proper universal counter is probably not a fully equipped lab. So you've got to have one of these. And ordinarily, yes, this would be the right tool for the job. Let's plug it in here. And uh, yes, we can measure uh, frequency, of course. That's, you know, it's a frequency counter, right? But the key is in the title, universal counter. It actually counts stuff. It's got other modes where many different modes. You can do phase, duty cycle, all that sort of jazz, but it's got a totalized mode. It does exactly what you think it does. It counts things and here it is. And you go into gate time and you can actually set the gate time to one second like this. So there it is. We can actually get our count on this thing. But just like any instrument, you've got to actually set it up properly. You notice we're getting like the 206, 212 or whatever it was uh, before. That's because we haven't 50 ohm terminated and uh, it's a bit over the level. So it's probably counting some extra pulses. Let's put the attenuator on there. You got to set it up. But once you set it up, bingo, we're getting the exact same thing. And ordinarily, yes, this is an excellent tool, and yes, it does have statistics on it, but unfortunately, the reason I didn't use it for this is, A, it's not visual, so you can't actually see the waveform, which is kind of uh, handy on a scope, but uh, also the stats, unfortunately, do not work in the totalized mode. Wah, 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 wah. They work just fine in frequency uh, counter mode, of course. You can go in there and you can do all your stats and everything else, but in totalized mode, it doesn't work. Why? It's just a software thing. Why can't they put, you know, uh, just a simple average on the thing for totalize? I don't get it. Anyway, you can like single shot capture it just like on a, on a scope. There you go. And of course, you can extract the data out of it and uh, average it that way and get a graph and everything else, you know, a plot and everything else. But meh. Anyway, so yeah, ordinarily this would be the tool for the job because you don't have to worry about sample rate and your memory depth and all that sort of rubbish. As long as you set it up correctly, this puppy will do the job. It'll capture those counts no matter how short they are. It's got hardware in there specifically designed for it if your scope doesn't have it.
And of course, we finally reach a point where we just can't go any higher and we just can't do it at the current uh, time base setting. I'm up to um, 500 uh, nanoamps at the moment. And if I go to 600, we should expect a, uh, we've got 15,000 counts at the moment. Go up to 600 here. We should expect it to actually go up and it doesn't go up by the requisite amount. We go up to 700 nanoamps and it actually starts to drop. So eh, we've reached the limit of our current test setup. That's 800 and 900 nanoamps. There you go. But anyway, I've got ta -da, all the data from uh, 20 nanoamps up to 500 in 20 nanoamp steps. Beauty. So can we actually see this lead at 500 nanoamps? Well, this is actually uh, 5 microamps. So let's turn it back down to uh, 500 nano, shall we? There we go. Nope. Can't see it. 600, 700, 800. Oh, you can start to see it. Just, just. Well, that's at uh, 900. That's at 900 nanoamps. So if we turn it up, there we go. There we go, that's one microamp. Two, three, so you can start to see it. But yeah, it's <laughs> basically is not visible at 500 nanoamps that we're measuring here. But of course that photon counter can easily see it. It is ridiculously sensitive. That's why these things are very, very, uh, very expensive and also very uh, sensitive to light and things like that. You can actually blow the thing if you just turn your uh, lights on here if you're not careful. And here's the fun part. We get to look at the data. Here we go. I've actually uh, taken it, put all the data into a spreadsheet here. And you can see I've um, taken out, the, I've uh, subtracted the dark count uh, value of 212. So I've plotted this data here of, oh, can't quite see it. There we go. Of um, the photons per second versus the lead current in nanoamps. And bingo, it is not linear far from it in fact uh look it ramps up there and then it starts to taper off again shame i couldn't go any higher than that um to see what it did you know plot it over up to milliamps or something like that right down from nanoamps but uh anyway well, that's a very interesting result it is not linear and it would be interesting to see if that uh, changes with uh, different types of leads as well i'm sure it does you know you get like a super high efficiency red lead this is just as i said one of those um ebay uh cheapies i have no idea what um but it'd be interesting to get you know one data set doesn't really show you well it shows you that it's not linear it's potentially not linear right down at that low region and maybe there's some fundamental quantum physics actually behind that it'd be interesting to find out so perhaps a maybe a follow-up uh, video in the future i don't know but uh, i just love getting data like this and you know that sort of a not entirely unexpected uh, result but i would have been disappointed if it was just linear it's like oh that's boring but no look there's it's very smooth there's like i, I haven't applied any smoothing to that at all it it really is that shape so you know I think that experiment worked really well, and this is some quite reliable data from this particular lead, at least, anyway. So, that's terrific. Love it. So, there you have it. That is very cool indeed. I don't really know what it means. I don't know the physics uh, behind it. I haven't researched it at all, but I just wanted to do that experiment because I didn't seem to find any data out there. Let me know if you, um, if there is other data out there, which I uh, couldn't find in my uh, very quick search, but that is fascinating. And it did switch on it. I think if I, you know, really got down there and measured the fine scale right down under the 20 nano amp uh, figure we might find the point where it does actually you know might be able to see a little bit down there but obviously it's going to follow that uh, curve and it's not linear so very very interesting anyway hope you enjoyed that video if uh, you want to leave comments always down below a uh, link to the forum down below all that sort of jazz catch you next time First of all, what we need is a baseline of the dark count. So I've still got the uh, protective cap on the end. That's the uh, factory cap, I believe. And uh, it will see if we actually get the 
below the maximum data sheet value for the dark count. So I've got my Rigol DS1054Z here, and I'm going to show you an example of where, you know, you have to have the right tool for the job. You may think you have the right tool, or you may think you know how to use the tool properly, but you may not. Anyway, what we've got here, okay, here's all the uh, pulses, all right? You can see them just jumping out, jumping out here like this, but... If we set it to a second, which is what we want, because we want pulses per second. So I'm going to set it for 100 milliseconds per division here because we want to measure the number of pulses per second, okay? So if we have a look here and we actually single shot capture that, okay, there it is. Look, we've got lots of little pulses in here, and I mentioned this in a previous video, and we can go in and actually have a look at those, and you can see that... If we actually zoom in on that, it's a tiny little, tiny little thing there. But look, all we've got is a single sample pulse. That's it, because we don't have enough memory depth to actually capture um, a one full second of the thing and actually get the 20 microsecond uh, pulse, which is what it, this uh, module generates, a 20 microsecond pulse each time it gets one photon out. So um, it just does not have the sample memory required, okay? And we can go into the Acquire menu here, and uh, we can see that our memory depth is the full 12 meg that this thing is uh, capable of. It's still, you know, it, it does not have the ability to do it. So how do we do it? Aha, uh -huh, I'm glad you asked. Let's uh, go back to, uh, we'll set this back to the middle there. Okay, let's go to our 100 milliseconds uh, per division here. And uh, what we need to do is set the oscilloscope to go to the acquire menu instead of normal mode here. Now, not all scopes have this, but this one does. We can actually go into uh, peak detect mode, okay? Bingo, watch what happens. Ta-da, look at that. They're now all full height pulses on the scope. That's because it's not using the sampling, it's using dedicated hardware to actually detect short pulses. I, you can go read the data sheet and you might be able to find what the minimum uh, peak value is. We're only looking at like a 20 microsecond pulse. Can easily do that. It's down in the tens of nanoseconds or something like that. That's what peak detect mode on your oscilloscope is really, really good for. So um, now we can go in there and we can actually single shot capture that and we can go in and we can actually see all of our pulses. Now it will, now it won't, sorry, it won't actually be show the proper 20 microsecond pulse like we should see, but it at least detects each and every one and will actually show them at their full peak value. Okay, so... Uh, it, it's going to allow us to actually get proper measurements without missing pulses and things like that due to the sample rate. Now, if we actually turn it on and we turn the time base up, there's our actual pulse. There it is. Sorry, I thought that pulse was microseconds. It's actually uh, nanoseconds. So um, it's where 10 nanoseconds per division, 10, 20, 30, you know, 35 uh, nanoseconds or something like that per pulse. And you can see, you'll see, you know, you'll see pulses pop up occasionally. Hopefully, oh, it's very, it's very dim, but you can, maybe if we can turn up our intensity, there we go, you start to see them jumping around there just randomly, and that randomness is our dark count. Oh, it's much nicer having that intensity up, isn't it? Excellent. But unfortunately, we can't use this scope, it's no good, it's not the right tool for the job. It's got lots of ability, you know, it's got lots of measurement options here, horizontal, vertical uh, measurement options, like multiple pages worth of measurement options, but nowhere in here does it has, have an option to actually measure the number of uh, pulses. So this scope, unless you want to, you know, capture them and go in there and manually count them, you know, it's going to have a couple hundred pulses. Yeah, this ain't the right tool for the job. And no, you can't use the hardware frequency counter because the frequency counter is not actually counting the pulses. It's counting the distance between the pulses, which is, of course, completely... If we have a look at it, come on. Parameter limited my ass. Come on. Ah, oh, what's it doing? 
Sorry, I went up to seconds there. I just turned the knob too quickly. There we go. Um, it, they're completely and utterly random because of that, and that's probably going to change with uh, temperature of the sensor and, you know, all sorts of uh, stuff. And you can actually buy a different grade. You get a different model here, as we saw in the data sheet, to get different uh, dark counts. So they bin them, you know, higher quality ones, so you'll actually uh, pay more for that. But this one is rated for 250 counts per second when the sensor is dark. And by the way, I had to use a uh, 50 ohm terminator there because this uh, thing expects 50 ohm termination on the output. There's a little transformer in there as we saw in a previous uh, teardown. So let's break out one of the big guns here, the Tektronix MDO uh, 3000. Let's see if this puppy can do it. Well, first of all, we actually have something annoying here. You'll notice that it's updated exactly like it did on the Rygot. It might be a bit hard to uh, see the... Can we change the intensity there? There we go. Let's turn the intensity right up so that we can see these things. Um, it uh, It's working just like it did before, but we're at 20 milliseconds per division. And if we actually change to 40 milliseconds per division, you'll notice that it's actually in roll. And I'll show you this. It's in roll mode. You saw it. It automatically changes to roll mode. And that's actually, um, it can be a little bit annoying in this instance. Hmm. But the good thing about this scope is that uh, we are on 100 milliseconds uh, per division and we actually have 10 horizontal divisions across. So that's precisely one second. So even if this Rigol scope actually had the ability to uh, count the number of pulses, you'll notice that it's actually got uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 different uh, 12 divisions on here on the one screen. So even it, so if you set it to 100 milliseconds per division, you're actually doing 1.2 seconds instead of a second. So you're not getting the right value. So you would have to make sure that it actually has have what's called a uh, gated measurement function, which allows you to set cursors in here, i.e. at that point there and that point there to chop out the two extra uh, divisions here and actually only measure between 10 divisions. But eh, the point is moving because, well, it doesn't have the count function. Anyway, it doesn't matter whether it's using the uh, regular single shot uh, capture, repetitive capture, or whether or not it's uh, rolling like that. In theory, you know, it's we can still get the same result out of this. And this one does actually have the number of pulses. If we actually go into the measure menu here and we go add measurement, one of the measurement uh, types is... Oh, ah, stupid dual bloody button pain in the ass interface. Who invented that crap? Oh, goodness. Maybe if you used it every day, you might, oh, I don't know, get, get used to it. Anyway, it does have the ability to ta -da, measure the positive pulse count and also the negative pulse count if you wanted to and you can set reference values as well very nice so I've already added that uh, measurement down here you can see number of pulses bingo 200 and 12 like that but you'll notice that I'm also using of course that we learned before uh, peak detect mode if we use regular sample mode we get the same crap we got before and we get a grossly incorrect uh, low value here. So, yep, real trap for young players. You've got to know precisely how to use your instrument to actually get this functionality working. But because, as I said before, the, uh, whoop, there we go, single shot capture, the pulses in here are all random each time. We actually have to do some averaging to actually get this thing uh, to give, you know, a reasonable uh, average value that we can use to then detect a rise above that when we uh, connect the lead to it and uh, try and count the photons. So the value is jumping around here, and yes, it does actually have statistics in this thing, so you can actually go into, oh, oh, uh, statistics, and it does have a gating function that I talked about before, so even if it didn't have the correct number of um, divisions on the screen, you can set the cursor to exactly where you want it. And yes, I know what some people are going to say. You don't have to use a one second um, total window here. You could use like a hundred milliseconds total window, get the count, which should be 10 times lower on average, and then multiply it by 10. And eh, you could do that, but eh, it's a little bit dodgy. It's just, yeah, just doesn't have the vibe. So we're getting the value we want, and this thing has, uh, you know, extensive statistics in it. And I've set it, I've enabled the statistics. Look, mean, min, max, and standard deviation. Everything's hunky-dory, but it does not work. It says low resolution, and regardless of 
what I try and do to this thing, I cannot get it to give me a mean value on the number of pulses. It simply does not seem to work. I don't know why I'm getting, I'm using full memory depth, so it's not like we're not using enough memory depth or anything like that. And by the way, this thing is slow as a wet week on the full memory depth, as always. Not available while I while acquiring here, because I've actually uh, set the memory depth to 10 meg. I had it on 1 meg before, and if we go into 1 meg, there we go, you can actually see it count like that. It'll be slower if I go to 5 meg, clunk 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 it'll eventually get there and actually measure it but well 30 well, that's a bit that's a bit dodgy for the first count 140 yeah you know this is not good if i put it to 10 meg it just takes forever anyway it's not a limitation of the memory depth that it's doing it's not doing the mean so i can't use this scope either and I've got all the right options in here, the full record mode, or we can just do the screen. It makes no difference. We still can't get any of the mean values. And you set it between cursors, does the gate in and everything. And uh, we can go up to the statistics, um, standard deviation. We can reset the, uh, like, it, it just nothing works. We can set our reference levels. Our reference level is 50% uh, or set to 90% before. It's still, it, it, it's, it's very powerful, but it just doesn't work. And let's use our Keysight InfiniVision uh, MSOX 3000 series. And this one is a Bobby Dazzler. It does exactly what we want. Not only does it have the uh, peak detect mode that we need here to get the proper ones. By the way, I'll show it again. Just it go in normal mode there. And yep, you just miss all the pulses. It's absolutely useless. That's a brilliant example of uh, peak detect mode there. I should just do that as a one minute tech tip video or something like that that'd be good um, and it can also count the number of pulses that's one of our extensive uh, measurement functions here we can go there and uh, scroll all the way through those and it's in there somewhere positive negative pulse count ah oh, it's got everything and most importantly it has a statistics mode and this one works a treat and here we go we get our mean value uh well, i've done 80 you've been yapping on for 88 uh counts here or something or 88 sweeps of one second so you know 88 seconds worth of measurements and the mean is around about 206 so you know i'm going to leave it running for a while and then we'll take that figure okay and that will be our baseline figure and we'll subtract that from when we hook the lead up to this thing and then try and increase the current. So we should see it go up on the mean. And we have to use the mean. We can't just rely on the individual counts because, as I said, it's they're all random in there. So, you know, you don't know if the LED is contributing to the thing or not. Just on, you have to rely, you have to get that mean figure. Otherwise, you, you know, you're down in the noise and you won't be able to pick the signal to noise, or you've got an extremely low signal-to-noise ratio, as it's called.